Well, good morning, Advent Anglicans. Good to be with you here on this 14th day of February. Happy Valentine's Day, as it happens to be. It is also the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany. We'll be entering into the season of Lent in just a few days on Ash Wednesday. And I'm hopeful you'll be able to join us either for our in-person Ash Wednesday service or for the Ash Wednesday service we're holding over Zoom. Love to have you with us. And I'm very much looking forward to entering into the season of Lent with you. But for now, let's finish out the season of Epiphany. Would you please stand as able as we enter into our time of worship saying, Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's join our voices together as we sing our opening hymn. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go ahead and please be seated now as we open up God's Word together. We begin with the reading from 2 Kings, which will be read to us this morning by Abby. 
The first lesson comes from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel! And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Our response for today comes from Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. Would you join your voices with mine, saying, The Lord, the God of gods, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and round about him a raging storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before me my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the rightness of his cause, for God himself is judge. The second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3-6. through 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Good to hear from God's word together. We're going to listen to the gospel now. So would you please stand in preparation for the gospel? And also in preparation for the gospel, we sing one more time this gospel anthem in our last Sunday in the season. We'll sing Alleluia, Alleluia, Jesus is our King. Let's, let's sing together now.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Well, friends, today is Transfiguration Sunday. This is a feast day that comes every year in the church calendar as our last Sunday to cap off the season of Epiphany. So it closes us out and we enter into Lent from here this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. I hope you'll join us for either the in-person gathering for Ash Wednesday uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, or online as we do one in the morning on Zoom. But for today, Transfiguration Sunday. If you're new to Anglicanism, new to Advent, um, Transfiguration Sunday is a Sunday in which we focus on the transfiguration of Jesus, that moment that we read about today in Mark's Gospel. It's, it's helpful, it's understandable that it falls right before Lent because Lent is going to lead us into a moment in which Jesus is going to look like a failure. He's going to look weak. He's going to look defeated at the cross. And the transfiguration comes in preparation for that as a picture of what lies beyond. The transfiguration comes as a way of saying that will not be the final word. So with the disciples who would have needed a little boost to believe beyond the cross, they they get this picture and we with them, with the disciples, we get that image, that vision. And it makes me think of this song that we often sing in the church, we have for years, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, right? I want to see you. I want to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Well, that's what these three, James, John, and Peter, who went with Jesus, got. They got the chance to see Jesus shining in the light of his glory. And what was the result of all that? Let's observe together as we take another one of our walks. This passage here opens with the phrase, um, after six days. Matthew's gospel opens it that way too. Mark is careful to pin it. Luke's gospel also ties it to something that preceded. Luke phrases it a little bit differently, but they're all saying that this transfiguration moment happened because or in conjunction with something that had gone before. So our gospel reading opened with, six days later, or after six days. But what happened six days prior? It's probably important, don't you think? 
Here's what had happened. Six days prior, Jesus was talking to his disciples, teaching them, and he made the outlandish statement that he was going to go to Jerusalem and that he was going to be um, put on trial by the authorities. He would suffer many things and would die at their hands. And that after dying, he would rise again. Jesus foretold his death to his disciples and his resurrection. But Peter had heard only suffering and death and had not really tuned in and listened well to the and resurrection part and rise again part. And so Peter decides that he's going to, um, he's going to chastise, he's going to rebuke Jesus for what Jesus has taught. And Jesus responds with that famous or infamous response, get behind me, Satan. You have not in mind the things of God, but the things only of man. And then Jesus explained that that terrible uh, foreshadowing was not just his own, but it was for anyone who would follow him. He said that anyone who would be his follower must take up his cross and die daily. This is what happened six days prior to the transfiguration. You know, Peter had heard only the suffer and die part of Jesus' own future. And I think we hear only the suffer and die part too when we listen to Jesus' uh, statement about taking up our cross, die daily, follow him. But Jesus wasn't saying that he would only suffer and die. He was saying that through suffering and death, he would rise again triumphantly. And as a side note here, before we look at the proper passage, When Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow him, don't get caught up in the, it's a call to suffering. Rather, it's a call through suffering toward resurrection. It's a call to glory, to delight. But yes, also to take up our cross and die in order that we might join him in resurrection and triumph. They are both both what he said of himself and what he calls us to, a call to life and glory. Even so, we must admit the passageway of the passion is grim for us sometimes, and certainly it was for Jesus. So, for those who were soon to watch the suffering of Jesus unfold and to feel horrified by it, they they needed this moment this transfiguration moment would confuse them in the moment of his suffering in a helpful way. It would be a counter vision against the vision of the cross. So Mark, and as I said, also Luke and Matthew, has textually linked this vision of a glorified Jesus with Jesus' own foretold vision of a suffering Savior. Jesus will become both. Jesus has become both. So, this heartening vision is what Jesus offers to James and John and Peter, who just six days prior Jesus had described as Satan. Fascinating that he chooses them and brings them. And what happens when they're there on the mountain? Jesus is transfigured. He suddenly becomes impossibly clean, impossibly bright, unearthly radiant. To me, it it harkens to that moment when, uh, that time when um, Moses would tabernacle with the Lord and the Lord would speak to Moses and just in the, the divine presence through conversation, Moses's face would shine with glory, with the glory of God. And everybody afterward would want to see Moses' face and he'd veil it. Only this is different in this transfiguration moment because here Jesus is not reflecting light like Moses' face did. This is not ambient light that's been soaked up and now is kind of radiating outward from Jesus. This light radiates from him. This light comes from Jesus himself. Jesus is the source of this light. And this makes it very different from that, that, that um, 
that previous sort of tie to, to Moses. Now, speaking of Moses, who shows up here? It's interesting who shows up in this moment of transfiguration. Wow. This is still quite flooded, you can see behind me. This is the water you have to walk through in order to get to the bridge. I don't think that bridge is useful right now. Let's turn around and go this way. So who shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and these three disciples? Well, it's none other than Moses himself and Elijah. What do we make of this duo, Moses and Elijah, in this moment? Elijah, the great prophet. We heard about him in, um, we heard about him in our Old Testament reading today, his departure. Yet Jesus outshines him as the prophet. I wish I had more time to get into this, but Jesus is the true prophet of all time. And so it's fitting that Elijah comes as his inferior, but comes to him in the same way that Elisha was Elijah's inferior, or we could argue that point, but was under Elijah. Now Elijah comes under Jesus because Jesus is the great prophet. In a way, Elijah represents all of the prophets. And now Jesus supersedes him. And in a way, Moses represents all of the law as the great lawgiver. And now Jesus supersedes him. Jesus outshines Moses because whereas Moses brought the law, gave the law, Jesus fulfills it. Unthinkable. So we have this amazing duo of Elijah and Moses and both of them coming under Jesus. Jesus representing the law and the prophets in a way that no one could have prior. Interesting little bit about these two men, Elijah and Moses, is that both of their deaths are sort of without record. We don't have this direct record of Moses dying. We just know that he wasn't around anymore. And with Elijah in our Old Testament passage today, we see that he's taken up into heaven. Don't know how that one worked, but that's what we've got. Fascinating to me that these two who maybe cheated death in a way, perhaps, are the ones who now come to conference with Jesus who will face death and overcome it, face death and overwhelm it. Perhaps more importantly, the nature of these two shows up in Luke's account because Luke tells us a bit about what they were discussing. Luke says that the nature of their conversation, these three, was that they were talking about Jesus' exodus, which he would accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, a lot of translations don't say his exodus. If you go over to Luke and you look up the transfiguration passage, it might say his departure. But the Greek word is exodus. And, um, you know, Moses knew a thing or two about exodus. So it's fitting that he would be the one conferencing with Jesus about the exodus that Jesus would accomplish in Jerusalem. And as for Elijah, whew, he knew a thing or two about the corrupt authorities of Israel and how they would oppress the prophets. These two, I imagine, we don't know, but these two, I imagine, offered a sort of counterword of encouragement, counterword against Peter's Peter's word of, surely not, surely not you, Lord, don't do this. And these two, I imagine, said, let it be so. Because they saw in Jesus the fulfillment, the completion, the tell us the purpose of their own ministries at last coming to fruition. A counter word to Peter's. Speaking of Peter, he gets the next line in our text, doesn't he? Poor Peter. <laughs> Here's what he says. Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. First off, it's a strange time to call Jesus just rabbi when you see him and you're like, he's the son of God, he's the Christ, he's, he's divine, he's something not normal, he's not just a rabbi. But personally, I try not to be too hard on Peter here. 
a lot of commentators are, a lot of people when they talk about this text are, they really kind of huff and sigh at Peter. I, I try not to be hard on him. There's a lot of theories that have been offered as to why he said what he said. Why is he talking about the tense, etc., cetera, et cetera. But we don't really know what was going through his mind. So like I said, I try to be gentle, but the text tells us enough because the text explains by saying he was terrified. He didn't know what he was saying. He was terrified of the vision that was before him. All three synoptics uh, report that, by the way, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them explain and say, Peter didn't know what to say. He didn't know what he was saying. He was scared. He was terrified, Mark says, terrified of the vision. Now, please don't think I'm picking on this song that I'm about to return to, because I like this song. But open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. I'm not so sure we do, friends. <laughs> That's what Peter sees, and it terrifies him. The vision of God terrifies the mortal frame. You know, a moment ago, I was talking about Moses and how he was veiled and how he tabernacled with God and conversed with God, but he didn't, it's not like he saw the glory of God. In fact, in, in, in Exodus 33, prior to all of that, Moses is just kind of, well, Moses is in a dire strait and he needs sort of the confidence of God, the encouragement of God. And Moses says to God, boldly says, please show me your glory. You know what God says in response? Please show me your glory. I want to see you shining in the light of your glory. Moses is saying what we sometimes sing in that song. Here's what God answers. I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And so what does God do? He hides Moses in the cleft of a rock and he covers him with his hand. And only after passing by, only then does he uncover Moses a bit and let him glimpse God's back only. Because the full sight of God was deadly. And the vision of even a partially glorified Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration is enough to terrify Peter into absolute stupefaction. The vision of God overwhelms the mortal frame. I'll say it this way. The sight of God we were not made to see. But the voice of God <laughs> The voice of God we were made to hear. And so, this moment of epiphany on the mountain, this moment of transfiguration concludes with the voice of God the Father from an overshadowing cloud saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And then suddenly all of it is gone, Mark says. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Not a bad verse to sort of meditate on. Like Matthew says, lifting up their eyes, they saw no one any longer, only Jesus. The vision was gone, but the words hung heavy in the air. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. The sight of God we were not made to see, but the voice of God we were made to hear. You know, when I think of those words, I think that this command from God the Father in that moment we tend to treat it as if it's something exclusive to a very odd, admittedly strange moment in the gospel narrative. We think 
okay, that was a word that God spoke to those people, those disciples who were on the mountain. And it's a strange, the whole thing was strange. So I don't really know what to do with it. So we leave it there for the disciples. I think it ought not to be so. You know, when God gave the Ten Commandments, for example, to Israel, a very different group of people in a very distant time, Christians read those Ten Commandments and said, we got to obey these. These are for us. And yet, when this far more recent, uh, when this far more recent command offered on the Mount Transfiguration to the disciples, who were the first Christians, you and I are, we tend to neglect it or think that that command of God wasn't really for us. I think we do very little actual active listening to Jesus. I want to suggest to you that it's maybe time for us, maybe time for us to repent of that. Maybe time for us to return to a posture and a practice of listening to Jesus. You might say, why? Well, I, I, you know, I read the Bible and I pray. And that's good, obviously. But I want to encourage you to not just read the Bible, but listen to it, to what it says and to what God is saying to you through it. And let us not just pray. Uh, let us not just pray to God. Let me say it this way. Let us not just pray to God, but let us pray with God, both speaking and listening. I mentioned a few weeks ago that I was considering doing a, a, a whole a, a parish-wide Lenten discipline, and I would like to do that this year. This is something that we've done a few other years where I've invited everybody in the parish, encouraged you, exhorted you as much as you're willing to, to go with me in this, to say, would everyone in the parish please take on this same Lenten discipline for the 40 days of Lent? Now, you might have other things that you want to do. You might say, well, I'm giving something up or I'm taking something on or whatever. That's fine. Do, do that as well. But I want to give you something that is small that you can add into that. Um, something that I would like all of us to take on together as a parish. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a, a, a separate and individual email coming soon. But I want to give it to you now in this sermon in a summar summary, summarized fashion, as it were. Because it has to do with this notion of listening to God. What I'd like you to enter into with me and the rest of your Advent Anglican community for the, for the 40 days of Lent is something that I'm calling 40 Conversations with God. Let me tell you what 40 Conversations with God is. It is going to be a very brief liturgy for prayer, a liturgy for prayer that is about listening to God. You see, I, if you're anything like me, most of us as Christians, prayer is monologue. We sit down and we say, dear Lord, and then we talk until we say, amen. But we need space in our prayer to listen. We need to bring prayer from monologue to dialogue. We need to take it from being just a big data dump to God to being conversation with him. I mean, imagine your closest friend, if all of your conversations were one-sided, if you did all the talking, never any listening, what do you think that friendship would look like after a while? Not so great, right? And yet we do that so frequently in our conversations with God. So as I said, I'm going to provide you with a very short liturgy that we'll do every day except Sundays during the season of Lent. I've thought a lot about when and it's going to, I've been back and forth on this, but I finally decided I'd like it to be midday. It'll be short enough that you can interrupt your day for just a few minutes. And actually, that's what I'd like it to do. I'd like it to interrupt our day, just briefly. I'll talk more about that later. But suffice it to say, this will take a little bit of discipline for us to interrupt our days for a very short liturgy of listening in prayer. We'll give you something to print off that you can 
carry in your pocket. You can put on the fridge. You can tape it to your bathroom mirror or put it on the dash of your car, somewhere where you will see it every day, midday, and you'll be prompted to this short liturgy of listening in prayer. You see, the directive from God to the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, I believe, is for all disciples for all time. Listen to Jesus. We sing that song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you high and lifted up. Sure. But perhaps here in wanting that, we are maybe pining for the good that we desire, sometimes to the neglect of the good that we have. Well, God does not manifest himself. He doesn't show us the light of his glory. He does speak to those who don't just read God's words, but listen to them. To those who don't just pray to God, but pray with God. I don't think we're built to see the sight of God, but we are made to listen to the voice of God. I quote for you the psalm today. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Again, he is seldom the God who manifests physically, visually, but he is ever the God who speaks. He is the God who has spoken. He is the God who will speak. So let us heed the spoken word of God upon the mount of transfiguration. Let us be Christians who listen to Jesus. And the Father says still, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Amen. Great. 
grace is overflowing from the Savior's heart. Rest here in His wondrous peace. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. Satisfied, He is all that I need. May it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus. Satisfied, He is all that I need. May it become what may that I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus. May it become what may that I rest all my days. In the goodness of Jesus Well, it was good to respond to God's word through song. Let's respond now. If you're not already standing, please stand. And let's respond now to God's word by affirming our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, saying together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to be seated now, please, as we turn to the prayers of the people. In faith, let us pray to the Lord. Jesus, light of the world, may the whole earth know your brightness. Almighty God, you stand outside of time and number our days, yet intimately know the seconds of our lives. There is none like you. You are worthy of our praise and worthy of all honor from all persons. We pray for the many people who have never heard your worthy name or the good news of your salvation, for those who have not yet received your deliverance, and for those who scoff against it. We remember also those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, the lonely, the anxious, the addicted, the afflicted, the confused, and the hopeless. Have mercy on them. Have mercy on us. You alone, O Lord, can strengthen and sustain your church to the end. Hear our prayers for the worldwide church. You alone, O Lord, have promised to claim the ends of the earth as your inheritance. Hear our prayers for those in need of the gospel. You alone, O Lord, are the hope of the afflicted, the one who restores all things. Hear our prayers for those who suffer. You alone, O Lord, can reawaken our hearts to the epiphany of our Savior. 
Hear our prayers for our own needs and the needs of those with whom we share life. If you're joining us on Facebook, please use this occasion to write prayer requests in the comment section. If you're at home, simply pull out a piece of paper, write down your prayer requests, and submit them to the Lord. Let's pray together. O Lord, our Father, we are a people who once dwelt in darkness, in the region of shadow and death. We have seen the light of the world, Jesus Christ, yet we suffer still the division of our desires. Awaken our hearts afresh to his dawning, and mend our cloven wants and wills, as you bring all things to wholeness and unity in your Son, through whom we pray. Amen. Let us close our time in prayer, joining our voices in the words that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, having joined together in prayer, let's join together now in confession. Let's confess our sins against God and our neighbor, saying together, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourself. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. 
For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Would you join your voices together as we sing our doxology, and then I'll usher us into the parish hall. Let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, O creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We know. As always, it's wonderful to gather with you for the live liturgy. And my reminder every other Sunday or so is that while the liturgy is done, our time together is not this morning. I want to encourage you to please come into the parish hall. That's where we do announcements and that's where we do uh, connecting with each other. We're going to forego the connection with each other again this Sunday. And I'm going to divert everyone over to uh, the Canterbury House for 
the other half of Father Bruce's teaching on the Psalms. But first, please everybody come into the parish hall. We'll do announcements, have a quick point of connection with each other, and we'll, we'll jump over to the Canterbury House directly from there. Look for the link in the chat here, or look for the link in the newsletter, or on our live liturgy webpage in order to access the parish hall. Come on in there, get yourself some coffee. I'll see you there in just a moment.